Hello, this is Cherry Red TV. My name is Matt Bristow, and I'm joined again today by Cherry Red Records founder and chairman Ian McNay for the second part of our discussion about 30 years uh, of the iconic record label. Welcome, Ian. Thank you. Hello. Um, so, we left off part one of the interview, sort of circa summer 1983. Um, the label had been running for around five years. You'd had a period of relative success, become well established as a label, had some seminal releases. Um, Mike Alway had played a, a big part in the operation as your A&R man. Um, and then all of a sudden you, you come back from holiday one day and, and Mike uh, has left his resignation letter on your desk. Um, how much of a blow was that to the label and how did you sort of set about life after Mike, as it were? Well, it was really unexpected. I was, I was in America. It was, uh, I'd gone for a new music seminar in New York and also had a bit of a holiday there as well. And I, and I knew he resigned. Someone told me from the office on the phone that he resigned. So I knew what to expect when I got back. Um, it, was, uh, it was a blow because uh, Mike and I had, a, I thought, a pretty good personal relationship. We got on well. We worked well together. We were a good team because he was very creative. He was very good at A&R, very good at press. And I, I held together the business side, which was, and that was, a, that was, a, was, a, was a good marriage in a way, business marriage. And to, uh, you know, it's also disappointing. He didn't resign to my face. He just left a letter on my desk. So I got back. He wasn't in that day. And it was difficult. I'd been on a plane all night as well, which didn't, didn't help matters much. And to make it even more difficult, I had to also that day fire um, Phil Langham, who ran Anagram Records, because he'd been he'd been taking too many drugs in the office, and it just that wasn't working either. So not only did I lose Mike, I lost the head of the, our other main label, Anagram, too. So it was a that was a difficult day. And I remember I also I was I was a bit pissed off with Mike, and uh, he was going into partnership with Jeff Travis, who who ran Rough Trade, to form this new company, Blanco Negro. And I rang Jeff up and I said, Jeff, I think you owe it to come round to me and explain what's going on, which probably wasn't the most tactful thing to do. <laughs> and I made Jeff come round to the office and I gave him an ear for that that night as well. So um, I don't know if I handled that the best way, but it was what it was. And then, you know, come the weekend and come Monday morning, one picks oneself up and gets on with life. So Mike had um, an A&R AR assistant called John, John Hollingsworth, he was pretty bright chap, quite creative. So I made him the A and R director. Well, it wasn't director, but head of A and R. And we had certain acts that were left. We lost. Um, we didn't realise straight away, but we lost everything but the girl after a few months. And uh, the monochrome set went. Fantastic something. There was a big buzz about. They went. And it looked like we were going to lose felt, but we didn't in the end because Warner Brothers, who were backing Blanco Negro didn't actually want to sign Felt. So we still had Felt and we had Alice in Gaza and some other acts. So we had some, we had some records in the pipeline and they, and they came out. And John went about finding some new acts. Um, it must have been a very difficult time though, particularly when you talk about the calibre of those acts that had left. I mean, they were some of the vanguard acts on the label. If you think about yeah. any label, at any time, if they lost two or three of their major acts, it must be an incredibly challenging time to, you know, continue progress forward, as it were. Well, yeah, but I think in business you get to either ups and downs, and I've been going, we've been going a few years, and I had already had ups and downs anyway, and you have to pick yourself up and get on with it, really. Um, there isn't really time to to feel sorry for yourself. You have to look forward and see what you've got still and build from that, and that's what we did. And I had a good team of other people there as well. There was Theo around the publishing, um, and, some, and some of the girls there were really good. So we had, we had a bit of a team, and, and, we, and, we, and we moved forward. And John, um, John brought some signings in. There was one Red Box, uh, there was a band called Red Box, who they actually pretty much walked in the office with the finished master of um, a single called Chenko, which actually was nearly a hit for us. 
So that, that gave us a boost again. Uh, he also signed um, a Yugoslavian band um, called Lyback, who had got a, again had a really good buzz, and they um, they sold quite a few records. Both their initial 12-inch single and their album sold well. So we, we had we had records that were selling. Um, the next artist, Gars album, did did well. I think we had two more Felt albums. They both did well, including the Felt uh, Primitive Painters track that involved um, the Cocteau Twins. That sold really well and was number one in the independent chart. And we also obviously had we had a good catalogue that was that was selling too. So life wasn't all bad by by a long way, although. We had to make some adjustments and, um, you know, it was difficult in one way, yes. You mentioned the, the Anagram label there. Um, we didn't touch on that. I, I think that came into the Cherry Red family towards the end of part one of our discussion in the early 1980s. Can you explain how that acquisition came around and what part that the Anagram label has played in, in the Cherry Red family of labels over the years? Yeah, well, we started it, that was Theo's idea, actually. We started Anagram um, because, because with Mike running Trey Red, Trey Red had a distinct image. Am, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, it did, actually. It, it, it did have a kind of an image, and there were certain things that fitted and certain things didn't fit. And we were being offered quite a few of the punk bands, which were being signed for publishing anyway. And we were basically signing the publishing and then saying, well, it didn't fit on Trey Red. You have to go elsewhere to get a record deal. We sounded a bit daft. So we started this label called Anagram. And we chose the word Anagram because it didn't mean anything. So whatever, whatever image we had for the label, the label name would back up because it didn't, didn't come with a preconceived image at all. So and we started, I think, with One Way System, Alien Sex Fiend, Angelic Upstarts who've been dropped by Warner Brothers. So we had a Vibrators who've been dropped by CBS. We had a good roster straight away. Um, what had happened previously, actually, again, it was Theo. He um, came up with a compilation idea called Punk and Disorderly. Great title, Punk and Disorderly. Yeah. And he put the album together. And because we didn't actually have a vehicle for it, gave it to Abstract Records to release. And the album got the top 40. And that was a bit of a waste, really. Mm. We could have had that on our own Very label. Much. So, so that again was another reason for us to uh, to start the Anagram label. Um, and it was run by a chap called Phil Langham, who'd been a, the singer in a band called The Dark, uh, who were a kind of a goth band. Um, and he signed most of the acts to the to Anagram, and uh, Anagram quite quite quickly became quite successful. Sold quite a few records and had a good. A good reputation, and it was you know it was easier then to add records to the chair, to, to add labels to the Cherry Red Records stable, because we had all the the different parts of it in place. The obviously the royalty department and the um, the manufacturing we had sorted, distribution we had sorted. So basically, the label manager would look after A and R and press, and everything else was handled in house. So an another label that uh, was bought in during this second period of time that we're discussing was uh, the All New Sound yes. label, um, headed by Adrian Sherwood. OK. There's quite a, it's quite a sort of departure from any kind of uh, sound that the label had been known for before, wasn't it? Yeah, well, Adrian was just starting off. I think he'd done one album before with the New Age Steppers, I think, and maybe a couple of single releases. And he was, uh, what he was doing was interesting because he was white, um, from London. He was working in the dub area, which was really a Jamaican area. And some of the acts he was working with were Jamaican and some, uh, some were white acts, and were British acts. And I just felt that Adrian was well ahead of his time. He needed some backing to put some more records out and we were happy to do that. And um, I think it was six albums he did for us. And those albums, they sold OK. They also got, critically, they were very well received. And he went on to be a bit of a sort of star remixer. And now he's still a name and uh, still doing a very valued contribution on, on what he does. But that, that, that they came out on the Trey Red label. They had their sub on New Sound imprint, but it was basically Trey Red catalogue numbers on the Trey Red label. Um, 
Yeah, it, it, it worked well with Adrian. And I think that's what Trey Red was more and more coming at this stage. It was more uh, a catalyst for interesting musical areas, whether they have their own actual label as such or an imprint or just a producer working with us. It was, um, it was a way, of, way for people that had creative talent to work independently in a relatively stable environment and they all got paid their royalties, which wasn't the case with other all the other independent labels, unfortunately. Many of them were run in a not dishonest way, but a disorganised way. We were quite organised on that front. And was, was that kind of an organic process that, as you say, you started to bring in other labels, other people, other elements of the industry um, under the Cherry Red umbrella, if you like? Was that something that was almost a, a natural occurrence? Yeah, it, it's kind of people would, you know, walk in the front door or send a tape in or phone up. It was an interesting idea. And you think, yeah, that's good. That's worthwhile doing. That could sell a few copies. How can we fit it into what we've got? And if it didn't fit on an existing label, then we started a different label or found a different way of doing it. It just seemed like common sense, really. Um, you know, you're on an adventure of putting out records and something is good and worthwhile and you want to do it, you find a way to do it. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't always follow the, the templates that certain other labels were taking during that time. They had a kind of a very set path, set sound, a set image for the label, if you like. And they weren't kind of going to diversify outside of that. And it seems that Cherry Red has always had that willingness to diversify and bring in elements from elsewhere that it wasn't necessarily associated with before. Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's probably part of the way my mind worked was it, it wanted to do as much, wanted to maximise the opportunity. Um, and I, I, other people other labels, they had, a, they had a vision of a certain line, line's probably the wrong word, but a certain direction they were taking. And that, and that was their... But that was their way of contributing through doing, to doing things in not a more narrow way, but a more focused way. And our way, if you like, wasn't so much focused in terms of it was very broad, but when we did something, we tried to do it well and tried to do it the best of our ability. So uh, another significant uh, work that came to the label during this period was the song It's a Fine Day yes, by Jane. Yes, that's right, yeah. Um, had an element of, of luck in your, in your first discovery of it? Well, the story I, I kind of tell now and again, it basically what happened was I was having dinner one night with our, um, with our German um, licensee, a guy called Jürgen Kramer. I still see him, funny enough, at meet him most years. And I dropped him off his hotel. It was the uh, Hilton Hotel um, in Kensington. And then something happened. I don't know what happened. But I suddenly found I had two flat tyres. And with two flat tyres, there wasn't a lot you can do. So I rang up the AA rescue service. And was, it, was, it was a quite, a, I remember it's quite a wet evening. I was sitting in my car waiting for them to come. And then I turned on John Peel's show, Radio 1, just before midnight, before the show finished. And I heard this song, It's a Fine Day. And it basically, when, when I say song, it was just a cappella. There was no instruments. It was just a girl singing this song, It's a Fine Day. I just thought, that's brilliant. I really like that. And so, you know, in those days, I knew the people at Radio 1, so I rang up John Walters the next morning, who was John Pills' producer, and I said, what was that? What was that? It's a fine day you played last night. He said, oh, it's, uh, it's by Called Good Jane. They just sent us in a couple of copies. It's like almost like a test pressing. I said, have you got a phone number? And he gave me the phone number, the letter with it. And I rang up the guy, it was, um, he, was then called Ed, he was then called Owen Barton, he's now called Edward Barton. And I rang out, I said, your record, are you putting it out properly? He said, I only press a couple hundred copies. I said, I want to put it out in Cherry Red. So we came up with a deal very quickly, and it was out in Cherry Red about three weeks later, and we signed the publishing as well. And when it came out in Cherry Red, we got a promotion, man. We got quite a bit of airplay. It wasn't a hit as such. But it did reasonably well, and we did an album with him. And the album was, was very different, because the album was, um, was Jane and Barton, so it was um, Owen Barton as well. And he was, uh, 
I don't know, his influence was fairly extreme, so he was... It wasn't a very balanced album, let's say. It was more Barton than Jane. Well, it was more Bark than Jane, because he was almost <laughs> growling in the, uh, uh, on the record. But it had, a, it had a certain appeal, but if you bought It's a Fine Day and then you bought the album, I think you'd have been a bit shocked. But anyway, the, um, the album came out, did okay-ish. And then the, the real kind of, um, the real kind of jewel in the crown, if you like, was um, a few years later, when it, when it was covered by Opus 3, who the song was covered by Opus 3 here on PWL. And the song was a part, part five hit and we had the publishing. So we did well out of that. And that song has been covered quite a lot over the years. So it's like anything else in life, isn't it? You kind of, uh, you get your clues and your, your chances and then you follow them up and uh, you see where it leads and uh, either goes somewhere or it doesn't and that, that went somewhere. So I, I al uh, also wanted to look during this section at how Cherry Red as a company and yourself personally, um, as we said, this keyword diversified a little bit more um, into wider areas of the industry. Um, you were a very early um, independent adopter of publishing. Um, was that something that you always had at the back of your mind? Was once the label was started that you wanted to go into the publishing route as well? And how did you kind of set about building the publishing side of the company? OK, well, let's explain, first of all, that people that don't necessarily know the difference. There's, there's, there's basically two rights in a song. There's the right of the performer in the song, which is, uh, that's the person singing, playing it, whatever, which is owned by the record company. And then there's the right of the person who writes the song, or the people that write the song. And that's normally owned by a publisher. So... What we did, or what I did at an early stage with Cherry Red, was take an interest in the publishing side, i.e. the writing side, which most independent labels of the new breed, starting around the 77, 78, 79 time, weren't actually doing. So um, start, I started that, and this friend of mine I mentioned before, Theo, was running that. And we didn't really, to a large extent, know what we were doing, to be honest. I had virtually no publishing experience. And I was training him, so a little <laughs> bit the blind leading the blind. But Theo had very good ears, he really did. And the first band that we signed on publishing, apart from bands we'd had on the label, was a band called Blamanche, who he'd found in a club. And we signed them, we signed them before they had a, a record deal with London Records. And they had ended up with, I think, I think it was eight top 40 hits, which was a great signing. Um, and then at an early stage, we signed Matt Johnson, who went on to become the The. We signed the publishing on Tracy Thorne and um, Ben Watt, Everything But The Girl. We had to the go-between. So we had a lot of acts that we didn't necessarily... We had for publishing, we didn't necessarily have on the record label. And I think, yes, that was a plan that, that we had in our minds, that we wanted to develop that side, because the new breed of independent labels weren't going down that route. And we saw if you brought a little bit of the attitude of independent labels to the publishing with our initiative and organisation, we'd actually do very well. And it did over the years do very well. So was that, as you say, you, you kind of went into it with almost no experience? How, how much of a, a steep learning curve was it? Well... It, it wasn't rocket science, but there was a lot of detail that you had to learn, yes. And I just talked to people, I talked to the MCPS and PRS, you know, the collection organisations, and just found, got some forms, registered some songs, and went from there, really. It was, it was learning. And in the early days, you know, it's funny to think of this now, we have our, which you, which you one of your jobs is to supervise this royalty run of literally thousands of sheets of printed computer paper. In the early days... I was handwriting not only the artist royalty statement, but the publishing ones as well. Wow. That's what I was doing the odd weekend. I'd do the publishing, the publishing statements. That's what you did. Because there was no computers in those days. Very true. Very true. And did that, did that sort of find a, a natural balance alongside the record label, the publishing side? Were you able to make the two things run well uh, in tandem with each other? Yeah, that's a whole story on its own. I mean, we should have a separate programme about that because there was also another publishing company called Bayswater Music 
run by Martin Costello, and they merged that merged with Trey Red Music, the one run by Theo. There's a whole story there, but essentially were run in tandem for for many years, yes, and one bounced off the other. So, if we had an artist that came in and was signed to Trey Red, and the publishing was free, the publishing would go to the publishing side, and likewise, if an artist was signed to publishing, and it was felt right to release on one of the record labels, they would end up as a recording artist as well. So there was crossover, and they were going to gigs together, the people on each side, and it was it was it was it was, it was it's teamwork, yeah. It's interesting that you say that a lot of the other labels at the time weren't going down that route. What, why do you think that was? I think publishing had a certain mystique to it. It was a lot of detail. It wasn't glamorous. You know, having a record label is sounds glamorous. You and I know it's actually well, it can be glamorous at times, but there's a lot of extremely hard work and detail as well. Um, and with publishing, really, it was about about a lot of administration and making sure songs were registered and um, dealing with writers, which well, which you can be creative about, but it tends normally to be more a functional role than, as I say, a creative role. And I suppose publishing didn't have a very high profile. When you put a record out, you get you, know, you get your you get your radio play on John Peel in those days. You've got a review in Sounds or Melody Maker or any of me. When you're the publisher, you don't really get a mention. Oh, very true. Um, you also moved quite early into the audio-visual side of things with the formation of Cherry Red Films. Yes. Was the, that kind of blend between the audio and visual sides of, of content something that you saw very early on as being an area that you could exploit and would be interesting to go into? Well, what happened was that I got friendly with this guy called... His full name was Christopher Robin Collins. At that time, he used it. I think he's more just Chris now, but it was Christopher Robin Collins. And he'd made a few pop promos. And I forget how I met him, but we got friendly, went out for dinner and drinks and things and watched bands together. And then he said he'd, like to, he'd really like to make something longer than a three-minute pop promo. And even in those days, pop promos were relatively new. He was working for companies like Beggar's Banquet, other independent labels. And so we were sitting down one evening after a few drinks. I think it was my idea. I said to him, why don't you do a documentary about punk music? You know, we'll try and do it on a, a reasonable budget because I couldn't afford to do, um, to do it on a, on a big budget. And he liked the idea. And I think the budget was £10,000. Actually, it's a lot of money in those days, looking back on mm. it. But... We did this, we made like a 50 minute programme, I think it was. It was called UKDK. And it was a documentary about punks and skinheads. And he filmed some gigs and there was some live footage and there was interviews with people. And that film, that was the first release on Tre the old Trey Red films. And that got really quite well received. We, we put it out as a, as a video. Obviously there was no DVDs then, it was video. And we managed to get it shown I know it was shown in television in Canada, and I think some other territories as well. So I can't say we made a profit, but we certainly got part of the money back. And I was very happy to have made a, we can't call it a feature, but it was like a documentary of a reasonable length at a fairly early stage in our, in our career. And the second, the second project there was, um, was actually a film of Pillows and Prayers the compilation we talked about in part one of this, um, of this uh, series. Yeah. And, um, and, and Christopher went out and filmed some of the bands that were on Pillows and Prayers and very cleverly intertwined with it um, some very old adverts that he'd found. Uh, this is TV adverts, black and white. And also a little story with a girl sitting in, the, in her lounge. Very cleverly done. He was very creative and... Um, uh, that actually won um, that won an award at Italian, the Italian Film Festival that year for the for the best for the best short film, which was quite cool. It actually got a real kind of award. I've got a photograph at home somewhere with me with this award. Um, so and that was a, that again was shown on television abroad and came out on VHS at the time. And we also we made a video with uh, Alien Sex Fiend that was released. But I think my favourite 
from that is, um, and I can't claim to have a complete original idea on this, but Stiff Records um, released this album called The Wit and Wisdom of Ronald, Weeg uh, Ronald Regan. And of course, as he didn't have much, w much wit and wisdom, it was a blank record. Right. I thought, this is a great idea. And I thought, what can we do, taking that idea that's more practical? So we released a video and uh, an audio cassette called The Compassion and Humanity of Margaret Thatcher. And I thought, that would be a great Christmas present. It's blank, because um, I didn't feel she had any compassion and humanity at that time anyway. Of course. But, you know, it's a present, you can give it to someone, it's a bit of a laugh, and they've got a blank tape, so it's not complete waste. And that, that actually sold really well. That was one of our best-selling um, items on Chair Red Films, and it was blank. <laughs> so there you wow. go. Entrepreneurs out there, you can sell, you can sell nothing and, uh, <laughs> and actually do well out of it. Indeed. Um, on a more personal level, you, you also became more active uh, in the wider independent music industry. I believe you were, you were quite heavily involved in the formation of the independent charts. Yeah, well, what happened was, um, in the late 70s, when the independent labels all started, there was no really coherent chart to monitor how records were doing. There was the odd chart that would be done by a record shop or a distributor, but they weren't properly organised charts that were accurate. So I had this idea at the end of 1979 to, that it would be great if there was a proper independent chart. And by independent, I meant labels that were independently owned, that went through independent distributors. That was the criteria. And so um, I approached a trade magazine that was going then called Record Business. So look, I've got this idea you already compile national charts. You can pull this data easily from what you've got. All you've got to do is take out, take out the records that are owned by major companies or distributed by major distributors. And they like the idea. And, and the, um, the first independent chart was run, I think, the first week of, um, first week of the year 1980, yeah. And the first number one, of course, was Spids, our old friend Spids, where's Captain Kirk was number one. And that chart was a great chart for many years. Um, it's still going, unfortunately. I say unfortunately because it's lost all meaning now, has done for many years. But for the first few years, maybe the first 10 years, that chart was really valuable for independent labels because it did properly monitor what was selling. And that was a great help for, for people trying to license the rights to records abroad and for shops to know what to order. They could see what was genuinely selling. That was an independent release. Yeah, I can remember sort of reading it myself in my early days of sort of NME and, and Melody Maker and things like that. They often would print the independent charts in there. Yeah. And that was kind of how you discovered a lot of the bands and labels of, I guess in my case, it was the, the mid to late 80s as such. Yeah, it meant something. It was a real chart and it wasn't clogged full of things that were big hits. Um, and, it, and it seems from that sort of period of independent labels that there was a lot of cooperation and collaboration, much more so than on a, on a major label level. And that was kind of solidified um, with the formation of a group called Umbrella, of which Cherry Red were a founder member. How, how did that come about? Um... OK, I forget exactly when that was. I think it was probably the mid-1980s. And at that time, there was um, a monthly magazine called The Catalogue that was run by... I forget her name now. I'm doing her a big injustice. I think it was Cathy somebody. Maybe it'll come to me later, her name. But she ran this as, as a kind of labour of love. It was a little business for her, but she wasn't making much out of it. It was basically a listing magazine of all the independent releases, and you could take it, you could take adverts in there to help, um, you know, to help with your own uh, with your own label. Um, that was her source of income, basically. I think it was given away free. Um, so she ran this, and I remember she called this meeting um, of different people who supported the catalogue. And I forget what the, the, the reason for the meeting was. And then 
and there was a lot of people in the room and we'd all come together and we were all independent and I just thought yeah this is a great idea we should meet regularly and I think I, I actually took up the mantle of getting the next meeting together um, and then we would meet then fairly infrequently, well I don't know, fairly infrequently maybe every six weeks or something and it was normally in somebody's office or in a pub, in a room above a pub or something and we, and we talk about different issues, but the main thing was people meeting together to, to support each other, really, and talk about different issues that were important. And this, this lasted for several years. It was very informal. There wasn't really proper membership as such. And it was mainly me con just convening the meetings. But it certainly served a purpose, and I think it helped to support a lot of people that were up and coming and just starting their own labels. And we did organise, I remember, a whole weekend seminar at one point. There was about 200 people there. It was very successful. Um, and then fortunately, several years later, after Umbrella had, had sort of died, AIM started, which of course is a fantastic organisation with professional staff and really well run, which is, you know, far, far more than, moved on far, far more than where Umbrella got to. But Umbrella was kind of the start of it in its own way. So we're kind of up to around 1987 at this point. OK. Um, at which point you decided to take a break from the company. Um, yeah. Go on a kind of voyage of, of personal discovery, if you yeah. like, and see some of the world. Yeah. Um, what, were you, what were your reasons for doing that? And, I mean, to me, it, it, it seems like a risk, quite a big risk, to leave your company in the hands of others. Um, for, the, for that length of time. Were you kind of ever worried that it wouldn't be there when you got back? Well, it's something I felt I had to do. I was on a kind of spiritual search um, and that became more and more important to me. I was into meditation and looking at my life and I had this opportunity to do a project um, in a community in northern Italy called the Six Month Project which was 60 people living together for six months in a very intense environment and I thought I want to do this project and I've been taking time off before and I was gradually handing over the, the mantle to different people that were working for me but I thought my personal discovery is the most important thing so you know it was quite a step in a way I won't go into the whole thing now but basically I sold everything I sold all my possessions I got everything down to two suitcases one with winter clothes one with summer clothes and I didn't come back in the office for four years which is a long time originally I was going to leave for six months but it turned into four years um, but you know you somehow I trusted um, I trusted that things would work out. I didn't know whether the business would survive. I had a feeling it would survive. And at the end of the day, I was the owner of the business. And um, it could have been messed up, but I don't, I, don't, I don't think it could have been totally ruined. I might have come back to a, to a bit of a mess, but I didn't, fortunately. Um, I came back to something that was still running OK and being run quite well, actually. Um, and how... how in much in touch with things were you when you were away with what what was going on with the company? Hardly at all. Really? Uh, I rang up now and again. Um, I, you know, I wasn't stupid. I knew how much money was in the bank. You know, I was getting like um, a very brief monthly financial report. Um, and I could see that it was going okay. And I knew that to ring up and say we should sign this act or do this or do that was pretty was pretty meaningless if you leave people in charge. You need to leave them in charge. And there was a certain, um, how shall I put it, there was a certain uh, fallout when I was away. People didn't get on, certain people left. I essentially stayed out of that. I thought, you know, I'm either, I'm either there or I'm not, and I need to just let life do what it needs to do. That's what happened. Um, and I had a great adventure. And I came back and the music industry was very different and then I had to, uh, I wanted to get involved again and I had to uh, start rethinking and uh, replanning and that was pretty much marked the end of the phase one of, of Cherry Red and the beginning of phase two. So was it, for you personally, did, did you always retain your kind of love for and interest in music during that time away? 
and was it almost as if you were kind of re-energised um, to come back in 91 and see where the label could go from there? Yeah, I still love music. I was out of touch. I was hopelessly out of touch because during that time I was hardly in the UK. So as regarding the kind of UK independent scene, I didn't really know what was going on. Um, so there was a certain re-education process when I re-arrived. Um, and there's still records that sort of came out when I was away. They're on the radio. I don't know the records. I never heard them at the time. And I haven't necessarily caught up to date with everything. So it's a bit of a hole in my, uh, my knowledge and my memory of that time in terms of uh, the kind of UK contemporary music scene. And you, you said that the industry itself had, had moved on. Um, maybe those sort of halcyon days of the late 70s, early 80s for independence were to a certain extent changing, the, the climate was changing. So how did you sort of then foresee what Cherry Red's role would be as a label in that next part of the industry, if you like? Well, when I came back, there were certain realities. Um, one good thing was that CDs were becoming a really quite a big thing. But before I went away in 87, the first CDs were out, but they were only out. It was quite hard to get pressings. So you only did them on your big sellers. And when I came back, there was a whole host of things we hadn't done on CD, we could do on CD, and they sold quite well. I could also see the, the newest, the newer acts that we signed. I remember again, a band called Prolapse, a band called Tetsi Fly. They were still getting good press, getting good radio. They were getting in independent charts, but they weren't selling enough to make them viable. The sales were way down. So if we were going to survive as a proper company, you know, with a proper office and staff and everything else, we'd have to reinvent ourselves. I saw that fairly, fairly quickly. And that was, that was then I made the decision to start doing catalogue of, um, catalog of releases of the late 70s, early to mid 80s, which no one else was really doing. So I went round and uh, I, I bought labels like Midnight, Red Rhino, in tape, uh, flick knife, bought the rights up or, li or licensed the rights, the case may be, and started putting out them as catalogue reissues and doing them really well. And I think pretty quickly we made a new mark for ourselves and we were able, we we're up and running again. So I think it's fair to say that the, the cherry red of, of 1983, when we started this period, right. and, and the cherry red of 1991, where we're kind of ending this part of the discussion, became two very different companies almost during that uh, eight year period. Well, it evolved, it's like, you know, it's like anything in life, um, like we've seen the tremendous change in technology the last few years, since you started with us a few years ago. The whole technology side has changed enormously and the trick of the game, as I understand it, as I've learnt over the years, is you've got to be, if you can, ahead of the game, you can't always be ahead, but you've got to be right at the beginning of it. If you don't do that, you just get left behind. And yes, things did change. Um, and the stakes got higher and to, to break new acts or, you know, to break acts in the early 90s was far harder than in the early 80s. And the risk, you know, you, like you had to spend far more money put far more time in, it means that, OK, we should, could have signed two or three acts and put loads of money in. If one of those acts hadn't been very successful, the company would be finished. I wasn't prepared to do that. Didn't seem to be an intelligent thing to do. I didn't want to go to bed at night with that kind of pressure. So it was a question, really, of finding a new way to make things work, and that, that was reality. I think that's what you do. You adapt and you look at, well, something has changed, and you, you have to move on. That's what we did. That's yeah. what we still do. OK, so um, we'll have a look at, at how you moved on exactly in, um, in part three I'm of the discussion. I'm glad it's part three. <laughs> Indeed, yeah, next time. All right. Thank you very much for watching.